Bandwidth for this podcast is brought to you by ID8 Software. Be sure to check out all of their great Revit applications designed to increase your productivity. No chit chat before hitting the record button for us here on BIM Thoughts. We just hit the record button and start talking. I'm joined by Carl Storms and Dana DeFilippi. We're also joined by the incomparable, the way cool, the maker, the bow turner. Excellent. No shortage of adjectives there. <laughs> hey, how, how the heck are you? Holy cow, man. It's been like years since I've had a chance to catch up with you, Carl. Dana, I'm following your stuff now on Instagram, and I love your work that you're putting out. How gorgeous is all that stuff? Oh, thank you so much. But you have to follow me on YouTube. Ooh, is YouTube Instagram, your stick? Is Instagram that your thing? Instagram is awesome. I'm a crafter like many of us <laughs> in, the, in the BIM world, but I focus a lot of my time on YouTube and helping our community learn BIM-related things, mostly Dynamo. Excellent. Because I'm Dynamo. You are Dynamo. So what are you doing these days, Bo? Oh my gosh, what a great question. Um, And I think we'll kind of cover like history and kind of where we're at, you know, back at, you know, Pushing, pushing from the ADT days over into Revit and getting into the first add-ins and API and all that good stuff was uh, I've always had, you know, just that interest in like 3D printing and just all the other little tools to do, you know, at home manufacturing of just those little ideas that you have. And so in the course of everything else that I was doing, um, one day I launched a makerspace. And really? So, uh, yeah. And so these days I'm running a... 28,000 square foot makerspace out of Norfolk, Virginia called wow. 757 Makerspace full of tools, equipment, and I teach people every day how to design, prototype, and manufacture ideas. Wow. Look at you. Wait, where was this? I'm just south of you in Norfolk, Virginia. Oh my goodness. I am so jealous. We've had a lot of people from your area, actually, or at least not a lot, but I've had five people move down from Northern Virginia, Baltimore, D.C., to live here just to work out of the space to make their ideas. Really? Yep. I was looking at your websites, and at first I thought, good golly, $179 a month. Yeah. And then I realized. It's cheap. And then I turned around and looked at all the stuff I've purchased. Uh-huh. <laughs> and thought, you know what? There's $179. There's $179. There's more than $179. Yep. And if you just want to stop and start like you're dabbling, what a wonderful spot. And, and also, if you've got an oversized budget, like that's great. But eventually, all those tools, all that equipment has to go somewhere. Right. And so you start running out of space. It's kind of a you know pretty common situation that we hear, especially, you know, we're sort of in this uh, density rich population that's growing where, you know, more and more people have, you know, apartments, townhouses, as opposed to larger houses, larger homes, uh -huh. or shop space out in the country. Um, and for them to be able to have access to stuff like this, you know, it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah. You know, 3D printing is actually one of the things that I don't do much of. Um, I play with resin. I play a lot with paper. Yeah. Wood. You know, as you've been probably noticing on my Instagram, I sew. I make candles. I mm -hmm. knit. If I can play with it in a relatively easy way, I will. The one thing that I really, really wish I could play with regularly is pottery. That's like really difficult because you need, you know, a whole bunch of things that are hard to get at your fingertips, right? A wheel, a kiln. Yeah, pottery is something interesting. And it's, uh, to be honest with you, until this year, I've never done pottery since I was like in kindergarten, right? I think I made an ashtray for my grandma, <laughs> right? So like that was the extent to my pottery for everything. And then I've had a pottery studio. Gosh, the makerspace is going on eight years as of wow. this week. Um, and then, so yeah, eight years ago, I kind of pitched the idea and then just ran with it. Um, and it kind of just hasn't stopped. It continues to sort of like just grow into this wonderful community of people. But back to the pottery part, the cool thing about a space like this is you don't have to know everything. In fact, nobody here knows everything, myself included, but you can always learn from the people around you. Um, and I took a pottery class this past year, like, gosh, probably four months ago. Uh, it's my first pottery class ever. I took an eight-week class and a four-week class. I drink out of a coffee mug that I made. I eat off a bowl and a plate that I made. And then in my second class, I made a teapot, and my teapot did not turn out great, so I have to make another one. Oh, okay. Yeah. But like, that's the kind of stuff you do here. Like you were saying, like, you got to have all this stuff for pottery. And it's always been very intimidating to me, even though it's one of the oldest forms of making. But gosh, having a 
the right instructors to just teach you enough to be dangerous and then just let you get in here and play and experiment. I actually took pottery at Virginia Tech. <gasps> what? Get out of town. You yeah. got to come down here. I can't wait for you to visit. I was, I actually was an interior design major, but I minored in industrial design. Uh. My father, who's an auto mechanic, I've said that many times on this podcast, he would come down and he would get so jealous of the metal and wood shop that we had. Right. Because it was just incredible, the stuff that we had. I mean, we had a sand blaster, we had a CNC cutter, we had, you know, mm -hmm. all the things. But my favorite on top of all of that was the pottery studio. <laughs> so we just, we <laughs> really, really had it all. I wish that I had more time there mm. than just the four years that I spent. But yeah, I love playing. I love tinkering. I love crafting, eat, making things. So... Yeah, and I think all of us do, especially people in the AEC world. Like that's just it's inherent in our nature to to not just do big design, but also just like tinker with smaller stuff and want to like build our own stuff and make things that just don't exist. And that's the to me, that was one of the things that I really missed. And I think 3D printing really gave me that first experience to to make stuff at a small scale that wasn't, you know, go in the wood shop and cut this, go in the metal shop and do this. That I could literally take an idea concept like a you know, just a phone holder on my desk cool. Like here's an idea for one like that. And the next day I can make another one or I can make several of these and pass them out to people. And you start thinking in terms of production and design and getting stuff out that you really can make almost anything now with, with tools like this. Yeah. I've got a 3d printer and I haven't printed as much lately, but when I do it's, it's now for uh, utility stuff. I think the last last thing I printed were spacers to go underneath my daughter's desk. Right, isn't and, it nice just to have access to something like that? That in the middle yeah. of the night you can just take that idea and uh -huh. make it, send it to the printer, go to bed, wake up, and it's there. Like it's made right, me. it's done. And I've since upgraded my printer to the thirty-two bit board. What a difference that makes from yeah, going I, from eight bit to thirty-two bit. I feel I like don't have the skips anymore. It's quiet. That that was like that was a game changer in 3D printing for me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just let it run, and I'll be on meetings, and nobody hears it because it's very quiet. It's wonderful. Yeah, and I feel like printers are one of those things, kind of like computers, that you know you have one, but mm -hmm. it's not going to be very long before you get another one, mm -hmm. and then eventually you get another one, and then uh, you know at some right. point that upgrade life cycle, some get passed to other friends, and just kind of get passed down to other kids. And it's, uh, it's still even older printers, just passing those to kids or donating those to schools that don't have access to those can make a big difference for them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, um, I'm on my third printer. Nice. Have you done any resin printing yet? I have a resin printer in the garage. I don't like the cleanup. Right. If I could get away from the cleanup, I would re resin print more. Is it mm -hmm. the stickiness of that or the cutting off of, of supports that's... The the no, button. the toxicity of the resin. Yeah. No, that's a real thing. You know, there's, there's some bio-friendly materials that are out there. Um, yeah. I'm running a couple of form labs here. They don't really have any of the bio-friendly material, but some uh -huh. of the other brands like Elegoo makes, or companies that yeah. make stuff specifically for the Elegoo. The, my I problem have... is, is just getting that to be able to scale for a number of different users because people are really hard on equipment. Yeah. Well, the I have a Creality. Ender 3 as my printer. Yeah, great printer. And I had the Creality um, resin printer. And um, there's nothing to the, the resin printer. I mean, it's just one servo and a, and a screen. And it, I mean, it's nothing to it. I have not used that resin printer yet. I'm, I'm excited to see that. I haven't seen anybody with one yet either. I'd love to just kind of peek over your shoulder one day, um, just remotely. Um, yeah, it's it not... It's you. Uh, it's like two hundred fifty bucks, three hundred dollars for this printer. It's got a big tub on it. That's got a clear bottom, clear plastic bottom. You can replace the clear plastic bottom with a new one because as a, as you print more and more, you know it, it it deteriorates over time. Yep. Get scratches, what have you. And then there's a a, a screen, an LCD screen on the bottom that is a UV. Um, lights in it that's I think it's 2k resolution and so you set the big tub on top of that 
and you screw it down, and then you uh, loosen up the top thing that the little because it prints upside down. So you loosen up the the bed, which is the top, and then you hit the the Z the level button, and it brings it all down. Right, and then you tighten it up. You tell it to go back up. You fill it full or halfway full of resin, and hit the print button, and away it goes. It's done. Nice. So I think I get spoiled with the Form Labs. They made a really good thing that's repeatable. Like I don't have to do a lot of those settings to go in, switch, mm -hmm. and fill up. They got that automatic. It's. I don't know if it's a great design long term, but they've got a cartridge they put in the back, and it's yeah. got this little, um, you know, essentially a nipple on the bottom. And it's got this little finger that goes in and presses. When it says it needs to fill the tank, it just goes in and just presses it like it's a little button. And oh. it lets out, yeah, lets out a little resin and then a little more and then a little more. It just keeps poking it. Well, that's so, even better. Yeah, so you don't ever have to worry about, you know, letting something print overnight or for an even longer, you know, a 24-hour right. type print of having to fill that up. Right, because the resin, you can recycle it. Yeah, that's and that's a, a great thing about that. But like you mm -hmm. mentioned, the toxicity of some of that material is, you know, definitely right. one negative to it. But And then you got, yeah, the cleanup part is the is the is a pain because you got to filter the resin back into the thing. You got to have three sets of gloves and two sets of toilet pa or uh, paper towels and clean area, dirty area. It's just, oh, it's a mess. It's yeah. No I've fun. got a, I've got a few of those tanks where you take it from one, you then put it into this tank and then it automatically takes care of the wash cycle, you know, to get right. the, the sticky residue and resin type stuff off of it. And then another curing station that you just put it inside of, and it's kind of automatic. You set it on a timer, and yeah, that's the way to go. Yeah, it makes that a, a lot easier. But I'll tell you, the for the even though it's a little bit more work, the I wouldn't prototype with those. I would I tend to still do those FDM machines with the regular mm -hmm. filament until we get to that final stage, and then I switch over to resin because you cannot beat the the exact perfect fit to really see what this thing's like. Um, you know that a resin printer offers. Yeah, I I was very surprised with the filament printer, the plastic printers, the Ender Three, yep. on how accurate it is and how strong the models are. Yeah, in comparison, yeah, strength. I, what I've noticed is those resin ones are great to show the final one, you know, to get production shots, that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. But yeah. if you drop it, you know, that resin is very brittle. And even there's so many different materials. Oh, yeah. Compared to, like, PLA or any of the other materials, PETG, mm -hmm. you know, that stuff, you can drop, you can kick it. It's, you know, that stuff holds up really well. Yeah, it's plastic. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I was very, very surprised how durable it is. Because I've got stuff. I bought those um, pegboards from Ikea that look cool. Mm -hmm. And I didn't buy any of the pegs or anything i just printed my own and yeah, we then, have some people here do that at the space for like their organization and their section yeah what's the best thing that you've printed as a uh, like an adapter or something for that the best thing that i have printed is oh one of the best things i use all the time is a raspberry pi stand it has two legs that hold up the seven inch touch screen and then i made two little arms that come out the right side that hold the pie uh, like a like a little mini server rack, like kind of sitting next to it. Yeah, so I could see the so I can get to the GPIO port. Yeah, that's cool. And the other cool thing I've printed is a Mars rover that is about twenty four by thirty six inches in size. Oh man, that's cool. With lots of different parts and serial bus servos and things like that. See, I've gone the the other direction with uh -huh. my. Uh, cool printing i also have an ender 3 uh, v2 bill bill got me hooked uh -huh. um i've printed a google home mini holder so basically you wrap all the cord in the back and you just plug it in and all the cord is hidden it just hangs your your google mini off the wall super super helpful and the other one the other spectrum is a poo bag holder Poo bag holder. <laughs> after after everything's done, you don't have to carry it. You just stick in this little thing that looks like a little lollipop, and it just slides down. And when you get to the the garbage, you just throw it out. Well, don't get it confused with a real lollipop. Oh no no you you can tell the difference. But yeah, that was that was the <laughs> that's that's the beauty. You, you can buy them at stores I need and to like, ship me one of those, Carl. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah yeah yeah. That's international <laughs> shipping, but I have two big dogs over here that I really appreciate <laughs> that. And that's the beauty. <laughs> Little size, medium size, big size. <laughs> That's right. Yep. You make it whatever size you need. There you go. Maybe that'll be my little cottage industry. Yeah. 
the the Carl Storms poo pop. That's right. <laughs> Get yours now. So, uh, Bo, I'm got the uh, 757 Makerspace YouTube channel here, and I'm walking through your uh, tour of the space. Oh yeah, man, that's a like a quick little run through. It's uh, yeah. What do you want to know? What do you what do you see? What catches your eye in there? Well, that's kind of like it's. It's everything. When you think of, of a makerspace, and you mentioned a few of the things about what you have, but I mean, from the looks of the video, you, what don't you have? Yeah. And so, is it? I guess the quick question, then I'll let you get into it. Is it you have X amount of pieces of equipment, and then as people come in and say, "I'd like to rent an area," or do you have pottery kilns? Do you have wax? Like, like how how does it grow? Yeah. Gosh, what a great question. Uh, well, so I'll tell you, we have been in. Let's see, the way that I got started initially was I went to, I, I had a couple of other tech companies, right? So moving with the AEC world, I was always interested in software development and working with Matt Mason over at Avitech and Imagine It. Um, you know, we created a bunch of the, the first utilities for Revit and then kept adding onto those packages. Um, we created some other stuff like the, the BIM inspection tool and, you know, all these different things, scan to BIM, going from laser scanning. And working with Matt really got me super excited about software development. So... I spent a lot more time in that software development kind of tech world, and I started two other tech spinoff companies, uh, which then kind of took me to, gosh, one day I just realized I've got all this, you know, my, my home little studio had a 3D printer and I had other little tools. And I was running out of space, really, but I was looking at it going, you know, my kids were young and I think my now, but I have two boys who are now in high school, ninth grade and 12th grade. But at the time, just my oldest son was, you know, like, you know, just a, a few years into school, like second grade or something. And his school was like, you know, hey, we want to fundraise and get one 3D printer. And I was just thinking like, gosh, OK, like that's not a problem here. Why don't I just fund that for them? And you started thinking about it that and realizing like, you know, coming from that consulting world, you start thinking is, is that the right solution? You know, just giving them money and getting a 3D printer. And the answer is no, it's not because that one 3D printer, like each of us has one, you know, with the exception of Dana so far. Uh, but in order to give that to kids, like that ratio of a kid wanting instant gratification of, let me print that thing. And then it taking, you know, more than a class period or overnight to print it. And now you multiply that by the school with however many kids in it. And you realize like, that's a cool thing, but it's not going to help a single kid inside of there. Uh, right. At best case, they put it in the library and you've got a librarian that is now the overseer for it, or it goes to the IT administrator who keeps it under lock and key so that the kids can't actually use it. And so, I decided that I, that's not a good enough answer. And the only way to really solve this and to make it available is the only people that I knew that had this solved was kids that were in college. So like Dana, your story of having access to all this cool stuff was something that I know from going to school, I've seen since then. And a lot of the colleges now have even cooler stuff or multiple maker spaces technically all over campus. And looking at that, just going, all right, that's cool. But so you have none of these tools, then you get to college, you have all of them and then you graduate and now all those tools are gone again. And it's that stop gap kind of in between that I just realized an actual maker space that's in your community could really help those kids, give them a leg up, give them an opportunity to be able to scale. And the kids who really are drawn and interested in that can do something even outside of school. And for parents or, you know, other people who graduate college that have ideas or don't have access to all of that stuff where it goes away, this is their chance to still have access to those tools and equipment. And so, you know, where this stuff came from was I pitched at a tech startup weekend. Before this, one of my companies was a tech thing that had a zombie tag. It was essentially, a, oh, what's the, uh, it's Pokemon before Pokemon was Pokemon. And the idea was that it's a geo-based tool. I could see two people or two billion people real-time displays on any device that was out there that had GPS. I mean, this was, this was years and years ago. But at the time, I saw the, this is what I learned in the startup world. I solved a technical challenge to a problem that doesn't exist. And that's a fancy way of saying you came up with something really cool, but there's no actual dollars in it yet. And now you have to figure out how to make money with it. And so that was, uh, that was one of my other ventures with this was a fantastic time, wonderful product. Uh, you know, it wasn't a major milestone. And I think it was a little early in terms of that, but I think along the way, just, you know, being able for us as a small team to be able to pull that thing together. Um, as we went to this tech startup weekend, I was just drawn to, to launch the makerspace. And so I turned to my partners before I go up, you know, for that Friday night pitch. I don't know if you, if you guys have ever been to a tech startup weekend. The concept is, you know, you go there on a Friday, uh, you have either a small team or no team and just an idea. 
And, or you might go there and just want to help somebody. Like maybe you don't have an idea, but you have skills. Uh, I went there with some ideas and that's how originally I found some other partners. So the night of this one tech startup weekend, I went up and I kind of pitched the makerspace, which was a, a physical brick and mortar business. So everybody else is talking to apps and, you know, everything else digital, but nothing brick and mortar. And so I pitched it. Um, and I just kept going that entire weekend and come Monday. So, or I guess let's back up that Sunday night. You know, I go into my pitch, we had secured a building, we had kind of found space, we started putting together a site so we could take some money and I pre sold three memberships at $1,000 each. So that gave three million. Members. So I had technically at that point, now I had $3,000 operating capital as a new company. And so we're up on stage, we're presenting and I had this live view that showed our data, like how much we had. And while I was talking, a fourth person in the audience bought a year membership. <laughs> now we had $4,000 operating capital. Uh, and so in the end, that Sunday night, because I had some other tech companies in my past or that I was still actively working on, I didn't win any money. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't rank me the judges, uh, in first place, second place or third place, which were cash prizes. And so, uh, we were somewhere lower in that they wouldn't say where, and the feedback we got is that you have other tech companies, you know, how are you going to run multiple companies? Um, and now we're seeing more people that run more than one company. So uh, I like to say that maybe I was an early trendsetter with that, but more importantly is we we took that four thousand dollars and built it into what the company is today and those other people who were first place second place and third place didn't deliver anything so i'd say uh, i think we made something a little more long-term sustainable so absolutely yeah so that brings me to like you know just that whole part of like now where do we go like let's start this so you know i kind of did this three month i call it the like coming from software i was like let's give it a beta period of three months and you know can we turn four thousand dollars and this building that we're renting now into getting more people to give us money and building this as an actual spot that I want to work at, that you want to work at. So the first thing I did was I took every single tool that I had at home, my 3D printer, uh, like literally wrenches, screwdrivers. I took everything out of my house and I moved it into this space. Uh, and then like my plumbing, something happened with my plumbing at home and I had no tools. So I, then I had to go to the makerspace to borrow tools. <laughs> <laughs> and so like literally just, I took every single thing just to try to start filling it out. and. You know, looking back, that was hardly anything. And so with $4,000 operating capital to start and all, you know, those tools that we had, it, it wasn't a whole lot, but it's enough to show that versus if I would have had a $2 million budget and said, build this space out, do these things. I, I feel like the dichotomy or the difference between those is we might, we may have built something or added tools that don't fit our community or our need here. So I'm pretty happy with that slow growth that as money comes in. And like you said, Carl, that when people come in and ask for something, like they might say, Hey, do you guys have, do you have a pottery studio? And the answer might be, or, or, you know, do you have an embroidery machine? Uh, the answer is we had, and this is a real one that I'm dealing with this week is I had two people ask about it. I had an embroidery machine for a long time. We had a whole sewing lab, but the embroidery machine never got used. So I sold it after a year. And now that there's two people, you know, if two more people come in and ask for that, then that tells me that's the next tool that we need to invest in. So it's kind of incremental growth. Occasionally, you know, we do get a donation as well, where someone has something, they're moving. You know, we live in a pretty transient area. Uh, and what I mean by that is we've got the world's largest naval base in Norfolk, Virginia. So there's a lot of military Navy that come through and leave. Um, wonderfully talented people. And in fact, they are people that are impacted by that transient stuff that they might have had a wonderful wood shop back home. And when they're here and they're stationed here for six months, a year, two years, you know, there's no sense for them to build all that stuff back out it's way easier for them to pay, have a membership. And when they need to move, they just pack up and move. They don't have to deal with all those tools, all that garage stuff, or all the extra things that they accumulate. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I was thinking of too was, as you were talking, is not only do you have access to the tools, but you have access to other people. Oh, yeah. So if you get like a, a small order or whatever, like a you have to make 100 widgets or gadgets for something you can turn to the, your community there and say hey i've got i need some help getting these things done yeah yeah it's, you got it people helping into, you yeah it turns into part incubator as well for different businesses like i'll give an example there's a wonderful company called ardent candle um and ardent candle is run by this wonderful kid named kobe and we met kobe he's actually been making candles since he was 15 in his parents yeah. garage uh, in about eight months ago, he joined the makerspace, and it's the first time he's moved out. He's now 22 and at Old Dominion University as a college student. But if you look on uh, really TikTok and Instagram, he blew up on TikTok. 
he makes these candles that look like a bowl of cereal. It, it's, you know, it's white inside the bottom. It's got a spoon sticking out of it. It looks like Fruit Loops on top. And when you burn it, it smells like Fruit Loops. It looks like Cinnamon Toast Crunch. It's, I mean, these things are works of art. And he just blew up. And so by being here at the space, he had a small space. He got a business partner. They now have multiple employees. They've actually graduated and moved up and moved out this past month into a building right across the street. And now they have multiple employees. Some of them are, are members of the makerspace that are now their employees over here. So it's a great way for them to be able to test that. Bef like, that stop gap of how do I move out of my parents' basement before I'm ready to get myself my own store, my own building, you know, whether you're renting, leasing, or buying for that, there, there's usually one more gap between there that is that limiting factor for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so this gave him that opportunity. Like you said, it's really that community. But there's, to me, the one great thing about the space is, you know, it's not the tools and equipment, it's the community of people and the caliber of their level of knowledge that nobody knows everything and that I can go out here, I can talk to an engineer at NASA, I can talk to an actual rocket scientist over here, I can talk to somebody that does leatherworking, I can talk to somebody that does metal, you know, anything around metal, anything around pottery, anything around sewing, 3D printing, laser cutters, you know, CNCs, all that stuff that they're here to be able to help each other. Yeah. We were looking at a makerspace when I was in, uh, in Irvine for a little while. Oh, yeah. For, for, cause our, our model, we were moving our model shop or what have you as a place to make the models or to get a, equipment that we didn't have in order to make our architectural models because we still make physical models every now and then. And that turned out, to be, that was a, a good idea. But then, you know, 2020 hit and now we uh, have to wait. Yeah. So I meant, I think you're talking about Urban Workshop, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I met Steve. We actually got invited a couple years ago. Um, several different makerspaces around the country got invited to Washington, D.C. to talk about makerspaces, the impact, and like what more we can do. And so I actually met Steve there. And gosh, Urban Workshop is a beautiful space. It, anybody that's out there in that location, um, you know, in Irvine, definitely check it out. It's, it, it's beautiful. And I'd say, you know, makerspaces are all different sizes. There's not one. We're not under some you know, parent company where we're all the same maker space. So they're all slightly different. Um, but that's definitely one that, you know, I've been proud to be able to see from a distance. I haven't had the opportunity to experience that up close, but there's been several other people. I think you guys had mentioned it. Lonnie mentioned it. Uh, Jim Balding had mentioned that space as well. So, you know, a few other wonderful people that you know, kind of around the AEC world that, that have also spoken very highly of it. Yeah, it's a great space. And just for the fact that they would have stuff, equipment that we would never get like a welder for example if if for some reason we needed to weld something we'd go to the makerspace and and weld something or find somebody who knew how to weld there and, and help us get it welded yeah it closes that gap of where do you find people to do something let's say you're just doing model building right well right. at some point you're gonna need a frame or maybe mm -hmm. maybe a wood frame isn't the best solution maybe a metal frame for this you right find somebody right there that can help with that is like that it's just a natural you know good fit for that right it's great so a couple of questions that have come from this robust conversation we've had. The first would be, uh, Bo, you mentioned kind of like a part incubator. What, what, what's the main difference in your mind between a makerspace like you're running there versus an incubator like the one that 3M runs in, in Chicago? That's this massive space where stuff comes out of, companies come out of. Yeah, you know, and there's there's so many different ways. There's so many different business models. And, and what I mean by that is the, the way that I approach it is going to be different, you know, than a way some of these other ones. We choose not to take a percentage of companies. Some incubator spaces, um, especially in the startup world, they'll take a, a, a certain percentage interest within the company. So long term that they might take for a certain amount of money, they'll take 20% of the company. Um, and so to me, that's always been a dilution of capital. And especially in that early stage, um, I decided that wasn't something I wanted to take on in any of my other companies. And I didn't want to, as an investor back, I didn't want to do that in the future in, in that particular manner. So for the space, that might be one of the first differences is that people pay a fee. And, you know, I think uh, Bill had mentioned that early on, you know, that $175 a month we do, we found that over time we do monthly memberships, we do quarterly and yearly. Uh, we tried day passes and that kind of stuff. The problem with day passes is it takes a lot of hand holding. It takes a lot more attention to detail and people aren't going to pay for that person to stand there with them. So we have elected over the last few years to, to kind of phase that out. It's probably been 
you know, maybe almost four years since the last time we did day passes with very few exceptions. Um, and it's, it's strictly to be able to focus on members that are here because they get more value and we get more value together by doing that. So they do get price breaks when you do quarterly, you get price breaks when you do yearly, we just capture that money up front, right? So it helps us to know what our cash flow is. For me as a business owner, I can start to forecast a little bit better knowing how much cash we have in hand. Um, because, you know, we make money in a couple ways. Uh, or I guess maybe to answer that question a, a little bit longer way, how do we make money at the Makerspace? In my situation, we make money first from memberships, right? People pay to be here, either that monthly, quarterly, or yearly. We have, over the last probably five years, um, we've done studios. And studios started off as a, um, you know, we did clean space originally, where people that were moving up and starting a business needed clean space. So we rented another building across the street from our our former makerspace. And that was where we had all of our clean work. So we put the, you know, the nicer resin printers over there, but also it was more like, like a co-working space. And so that just kind of grew. And at the time there wasn't a lot of co-working around us. Um, since then, you know, co-working blew up with the popu you know, popularity of WeWork and some of the other big companies. Uh, now there's a whole lot more. And even locally, there's, there's a company that has five in five local cities, they've got um, a co-working space. And if you buy their membership, you know, you can go to any of those spots and work out of those work great. And I think in comparison to an incubator space, sometimes just go, having a co-working space that you can go to that isn't your house or your home just to get a different mindset really helps with that. Like there's days like I go to a co-working space out in Virginia Beach, you know, it's about a 25 minute drive for me, 30 minutes away, but I'm right there at the beach. But I take one day, two days a month where I get away from the makerspace here. I go there where I can be almost anonymous. And I can get work done if I need to do video editing work that day. If I need to do computer work, it gives me a chance to kind of be refreshed and be around other people. And so I think getting out of your house, getting around these spots where you can be inspired by other people or someone who works in a different field can, you know, it's just nice to rub elbows with those people that you can bounce some thoughts of, you can get some feedback or just to be around their energy. And so to me, it's that energy is what makes a makerspace different sometimes than an incubator. But that said, there's some wonderful incubators out there that are really focused around, you know, helping businesses primarily to launch. Some of them focus around quick scale or high scale growth. Um, some, you know, have other specialties. And so, you know, it depends on which one you're looking at or what your, your thought is your company, but having access to tools and equipment has always been kind of a passion for me. And, you know, ever since I was young, being able to take this stuff and, you know, learn how something's made. And at some point you want to tweak something or that mouse that you have, that mouse is, is awesome. It'd be better if it was just a little bit like this. And, you know, change that housing out, switch those components or, you know, you get something broke and you learn how to solder it. And, and I guess that makes sense. I guess that kind of shows that the the makerspace is kind of like I've got something I want to do. Uh, I've got the, the blood, sweat and tears to go that I just need that that CNC laser, that that uh, 3D printer, what have you. The incubator, there may be a little more um, support and, and capital and, you know, with the idea of making this, you know, the next big business versus a place where I want to go to do something that could turn into a business like the candles, which I looked online and are amazing versus just, you know, I've got some cool stuff I want to do on the weekends and this is a great space to do it. Yeah. And you know, one thing about a, an incubator space is they are really good about helping you to scale, like taking care of the fundamentals of your business. Uh, you know, we don't, we help people to kind of really like get to that prototype stage and then get their stuff up and out. Uh, but once they start getting into, I need to make 10 billion of these things. Like that's where, you know, people are beyond the makerspace at that point. And we're sort of that bridge just before there. And I think, you know, real incubators, but also your local economic development department at your city. Uh, even if you don't have a business incubator in your city, your economic development down at your, whoever your city people are, can be wonderful helps to make sure that you've got the right business license in place, that you've got, you know, the fundamentals. They'll help you even figure out like, how do you do your taxes and stuff? How do you fill out you know, all this paperwork or what are the other things that you need? If you've now reached the stage where you need your first employee, that could be a scary spot if you've never done it. And so whether it's a business incubator, economic development, you know, or some other group like that, you know, find those people to help because that's what they're out there to do. Yeah, that's a good tip, um, which nicely leads me to my, the next question I had in mind, which is a little bit more of, of the tricky one. But I think at some point, all of us have been through a shop when we're coming up through 
through high school and public school, and we always have that famous shop teacher that tends to have the the example of how not to use a saw because they have one less digit. Um, you know, there's a lot of things <laughs> that come to a yes. maker space. <laughs> uh, how, how does that work with with liability and things like that? You know, not to get too technical, but you know, there's oh, that sure. side of it that, that might uh, might scare some people off from you know starting up a maker space. Yeah, you know, I, I'll tell it in this way. Um, so. Uh, for the last few years, I've worked with lots of schools. We've helped to open seven maker labs in local schools, which are essentially like mini maker spaces. So, you know, they're not they're not competitive. It's great for us because it could actually be a feeder longer term with these kids that bubble up, that leave to go to college, and that come back here to be employed. And now they're looking to be able to make stuff, create stuff. So I, I think that was you know part of the impetus for us to do that, but also like teach the teacher, train the trainers. So this past Wednesday, I had a group of kids in here. This is the first time, you know, since the pandemic that we've done a, a kids related class, and this is related to a Montessori high school in our area. And so these kids have been, uh, for most of them, this is their first time in the makerspace at all. Uh, we've got a couple of repeats from kids who have been there previous years from, you know, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, now they're in 12th grade. So I've been here two or three years. But with those kids getting exposed, none of them had ever really been in a wood shop before. So we walked through simple things like, hey, I need to take this tool. And so for them, I actually had them doing a little bit of work for me, which was I've got a new set of uh, drills and impact drivers and stuff for the space. I've got a particular vendor that we use. Um, in our case, I've got a lot of DeWalt tools like that branding, that yellow. It's nice to have kind of a consistent color in your space. It just makes you look a little more put together. And so, you know, I'm not paid by DeWalt, but if they want to you know, find some way to sponsor us, you know, please reach out. I'd be happy to talk with you. Um, right now, your stuff is highly overpriced, and I'm, I'm continuing to pay for it. Uh, but that's <laughs> it. Um, you know, with these kids, I was like, hey, I need to find, when we do community build projects, like this past year, we had a group that came in here uh, called Open Norfolk. They helped through the space to be able to build out the infrastructure for 200 plus restaurants to get back open. Outdoor seating, fencing, street dividers, porticos, all these different things. So while the pandemic was happening, that stuff was being built. But we would go out and help, right? Our tools would be in the field. And sometimes some batteries would walk away. Some other tools, like, you know, just we, we would lose things that eventually some of that stuff came back. But if your stuff isn't marked. So I had these kids taking a Dremel and they're carving 757 MS in here, right? And so that eases their way into it. And a few minutes later, I'm introducing them to, a, you know, a scroll saw that, hey, I need to take this piece of wood and cut it. Um, I need to use a chop saw to make these cuts straight and, you know, across to be able to build this little box. Followed by, I need to take this big piece of wood and I need to run it through a table saw. In that 45 minutes to an hour that we spent with the kids, they went, they bit off just a little bit more than they had done before, a little bit more, right? It's a building process. Just like if you're going to learn Dynamo, if you're going to learn Revit, if you're going to learn any of these tools, you start off with some basics. What are the things you need to know? And then make sure that it's comfortable and just add a little bit more. And so, you know, within that session, those kids felt perfectly comfortable they weren't scared about losing digits. We talked a little bit about safety, but it's really the practices. So here at the space, how do we really handle that in practice? You know, for people just getting started, that's how we do it. There's regular days, like right now, there's a gentleman named Jason. And Jason is an awesome woodworker. Um, he is, he's a great metal worker, all kinds of stuff. But he's here on Thursdays. He's here for, thir for wood shop with Jason. And anything that you want to talk about from 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock, if you've got a project that you want to build that you don't know how to do that's related to wood, or you need to learn a tool. He's here to help you with that. And then so people look out for themselves. Uh, make sure that you know how to use tools. We'll teach you how to use that enough to be dangerous. And I want you to come and go with the same amount of fingers. I want them to be the same length and no extra holes. Like that's this little you know, kind of funny joke I say during tours. But it's true. You know, we look out for ourselves. We look out for each other. So if you see somebody that's doing something potentially dangerous, you know, people walk over and go, oh, hey, here's how to use that tool. Let me show you. And so it keeps everybody safe here. And we've been very fortunate, you know, knock on wood, that, you know, nobody has gotten seriously hurt in any way. It's because, you know, we tell people don't rush. And I mentioned that story earlier about day passes. When people had day passes, they would rush through stuff. And we saw accidents or more potential accidents. We definitely saw some projects get messed up because people were rushing around because they had to be out at a certain time. That meant, you know, things that take longer to dry, paint, stain, glue takes longer to set. Um, everything takes longer than you think. And so when you're rushing, you cut corners or you make mistakes. And that's when accidents happen. So that's one other way that we've reduced our mitigation for that. But ultimately, you know, we have insurance. Um, we'd like to hope that we never have to use that insurance. And 
but at some point, absolutely, it, it will probably happen. But I want you know people to operate as safely as possible. That's a that's a good point, and I, I like the the idea about you know taking it slow, and that's a good point. That's how I learned Dynamo. That's how I learned a lot of things. Uh, and, and the last thing that I'll say before I, I let uh, uh, Bill or Dana take the last word is that I love you that you call the place the Dream Factory. Yeah, I mean, gosh, I, I I feel it when I come in here every day. That this is a, like I don't know if you guys can feel my excitement. Like I am <laughs> I'm excited to be here every day. Like it is a dream. I have to pinch myself. When I walk out, I'm like, I finally got an office during the pandemic. Prior to that, the last seven years, I've, I've just always been out in the open, which meant I had a table here, I had a table there, and a table in somewhere else. And people would leave stuff for me. They're like, oh, yeah, I left it on your table, right? Which really meant I have no idea where whatever you left me was. And so now I have an office, which is nice because I can come down, so I close the door and get a little more work done. But when I open that door, like, I have no idea what's out there because it's new and constantly evolving. And it's that change that just brings about excitement that somebody's out here taking apart a couch that is this cool love seat that I'm waiting to see what they upholster it with. Somebody else is making this awesome device. Somebody else is making this thing that's getting ready to go to space. Like there's crazy stuff all around here. And it, it, that's the level of excitement that inspires me to be here. That's awesome stuff. That's, that's truly the, the definition of the, you know, do something you love. You never work a day in your life. You're, you're living that. I, I'm living the dream. I'm just waiting. You know, we're like a. That's the other side is you can live your dream, but you also have to focus on the fundamentals of business. And so, you know, I, I can't lose sight of that. And the pandemic was definitely a. Uh, we went from having, uh, let's see, last February. If you guys don't mind me, like sort of, you know, sidebar conversation. I'll, I promise I'll bring it right back to a point. Um, but at the pandemic, just before there, February is always like our tradition. Like we take a dip financially in February. Um, it's just like that's the cyclical nature that right after the holidays, right after the first of the year, it's cold in our spot. Not for long, but just kind of briefly. We're, we're in this perfect position on the East Coast. Uh, but we get just a little bit of winter, and then it comes right back. And so we hit our highest number ever that February, which is 135 members. Um, and so that's like you know paid people that, that want to be here at Space. And that was during our worst months. We're like, oh, my gosh, this is the year. Like, like <laughs> everything just takes off. And, you know, two months later, it's uh, we're down to like 25 paid members. And so I took a dramatic hit with that. But, you, you know, you look at that and there's been a lot of companies, not just makerspaces, but just companies in general that didn't weather or make it through the storm. Um, there's been a lot more that have been resilient, found other creative ways. Um, you know, we got creative in lots of different ways and use that as an opportunity to sort of, you know, retool some spaces. Uh, and this is where we were talking about financially earlier. We added, a, you know, more studio spaces because that brings in higher dollar. We give up some space, but it becomes higher dollar because people occupy that physical space. And all of our studios have been, every time we build one or two or a couple more that we add, they're filled out. We have very little turnover. So we got you know a little more creative with that. And I think in the end, even though we're still, what are we, 109 members now, um, at least as of this week, like, like we've more than made up for that by that studio, by the tools, the tweaks, and just you know taking that time and weathering through it. But you can't forget those basics of business and a lot of times when you make your hobby your day job, um, you know, you want to follow that passion. You know, you got to pay attention, though, to those fundamentals of business. Dana, I'm going to give you the final thought. The final thought, I guess. And I think it's a pretty reoccurring theme on our podcast is keep making, right? Keep playing, keep you know, being artistic, whatever that means to you and in, in whatever sense being artistic might be. Even if that's rebuilding cars or building websites or whatever it might be. I think that's one really beautiful thing about our industry is that people enjoy making things. And thank you, Bo, for bringing that to us, allowing us to have that at our fingertips when a lot of the time it's really impossible. Yeah, thank you. Um, but you know, you know, Dana brings up something really nice. Like, be inspired by stuff that you do. And if you're finding yourself not inspired, you know, that's a time to go out somewhere and find that inspiration. You know, I, I kind of hit a, a block a couple of years, or this was several years ago now. But you know, looking artistically of like what to make and create, continue to be inspired. And you know, I started. I built some projects for Burning Man. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to go out to Burning Man or be part of that. But that was a that was a groundbreaking moment for me to go out to Burning Man and see art produced at a big scale by some of the top tech talent that's out there. And these are people that work at Google, Facebook, that you know, work at all the big letter companies that you've heard of that 
they build cool stuff. And it's the first time that I, I saw, you know, not just things that were powered by a generator. Uh, first time I went out there, I saw three art projects that, you know, I go out there and I look at stuff and try to reverse engineer how to make it right. And so this, you know, I'm looking at this stuff and, you know, the artists are standing right there and they'll talk to you and chat and everybody's just super friendly. And one of the things that I found was like, I'm trying to figure out how it's powered. The guy goes, oh, it's hydrogen powered. And he goes, this is my first hydrogen project. And I was like, well, tell me about it. He goes over and he opens up everything. And literally, here's this cool art project. And it's all lit up and powered by hydrogen. And, you know, to be inspired like that. And then, you know, the next year we came back, we built this gigantic 55 foot tall birthday cake called the Happy Birthday Mega Cake. And so that was built here at the Makerspace. We took like 35 people from the space and packed it into a shipping container, shipped it out. Uh, went out there and then we built this thing. Um, got to play so, on it. So for a you week. shipped thirty-five people in a shipping container. Close. And uh, we <laughs> we shipped a fifty-five foot tall birthday cake in a fifty-seven foot shipping container. Um, oh, okay. You put yeah. the people in the cake. Yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> the, the people got added later. It's like baking the right things. You get the right ingredients. So oh, okay. All we right. We took all these people out there, and then just wonderful community of other people came to help us finish building it. Um, got to enjoy it. Wish everybody happy birthday and play on this thing. And then burn it down. And so, you know, the thing about this that I took away was, gosh, what a wonderful opportunity to see art on a big scale that you might not see anywhere else. So, you know, for some people, it's going out to the desert to find that inspiration. And for other people, it's just, you know, taking an afternoon instead of working at home, go out to a coffee shop, go somewhere else just to like change your environment, and, you know, be inspired. And so, you know, Dana, I appreciate you kind of sharing those words that that's a, that's a great way to do that. You know, don't don't lose that that interest in doing stuff. And on that note, we'll call it an episode. Thanks, Bo. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Um, Carl, Bill, Dana, it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I will kind of end with this, that if anybody finds themselves around North Virginia, please feel free to come and visit. You're welcome to follow us at 757 Makerspace. We're on Instagram and most of the other social platforms. Um, my YouTube channel is small but growing, so if you want to see what the space looks like, you're welcome to jump onto our YouTube channel at 757 Makerspace. Uh, and I look forward to making more things with you.